My name is Hildra Gui and I'm the founder of a local vegan beauty brand. So I make a range of skincare as well as body and hair care, like soaps, solid shampoos, solid conditioners, and I use only fully natural plant-based ingredients. For example, turmeric. I use it in one of my solid shampoos because it's meant to heal the scalp. It's very antibacterial, it helps to reduce inflammation. So there's really a lot of benefits from just one root plant like this. So I actually make all the products fresh here in the beauty kitchen, uh, weekly, sometimes daily. And I'm always on the hunt for new natural ingredients that can heal the skin. I think there's a lot to learn from our past. So I like to go back in time to look for natural remedies that people use because it was much simpler, yet they were able to also um, find solutions to heal themselves. I believe that this is something that is worth exploring. I would imagine that in the past, natural remedies that people use um, to heal themselves will be a lot more experimental and direct. I imagine that before there were hospitals and pharmacies, there might have been traditional healers who foraged for herbs and plants directly from the forest around them and created healing concoctions by experimenting with the properties of these plants. And they might have had a secret ingredient, a super plant, that was so effective it cured everyone who took it. So I don't know what kind of ingredient that might be and that's what I would like to find out. Given the times we live in, I thought it appropriate to begin my search for natural cures by looking into past pandemics. And I find that the worst pandemic to ever hit Singapore was the Spanish flu 100 years ago. Given the whole COVID situation right now, I'm really interested to find out what happened then. Especially since I know how an epidemic can lead to an increased demand for certain products. So what remedies did people use back then to protect themselves from the disease? People, I think, were not really sure what hit them. As one of the first academics to study the Spanish flu in Singapore, Dr Liu is the best person to help me. Dr Liu, I'm curious about the Spanish flu and how it affected Singapore back then. The Spanish flu, or what they call the influenza of 1918, was globally transmitted all the way from North America down to New Zealand during the year of 1918, yeah. which was also the final year of the First World War which millions died. Uh, but these millions were pale in comparison with the uh, Spanish influenza that took about 50 million people. Dr Liu shares that globally, the pandemic ravaged for two years, killing about 5% of the world's population. But here in Singapore, it only lasted a few months, though not without severe casualties, officially claiming about 2,800 lives. But bear in mind that um, the fatality rates were probably much higher. And um, there were even reports that um, in some village, in one village of 60 people, only 12 survived. Wow. How did people react then? I mean, did they panic when this first broke out? I did not come across any reports about panic, but I assumed that would be the case because you have entire communities that are stricken. Let me play you a recording from the oral history interviews mm -hmm. who give you an impression of the influenza in 1918 from a very personalised perspective that you will not get it in the newspapers. Mm. In the beginning, doctors didn't know what to do. They tell you, go home, drink a lot. They didn't seem to have any regular cure for it. I remember I saw the numbers of boys went down, went down, so that in the class you might have only three or four turning up while the flu was on. And undertakers had to work very fast. Sometimes uh, a body would be in the house for a month or more, 
waiting for a coffin and waiting to be buried. Yeah, that was a, a disastrous sight. So these are the very similar with the counts that we uh, read in the uh, newspapers here. There were not enough living to bury the dead. People were getting absent of disappearing, and there you can see the kind of of, of anxiety. Death comes looming closer yeah. and closer to you yourself and you may not know when you are the, will be the next person. It's reminding me so much of, uh, of the COVID yeah. situation. So how did the local communities try to protect themselves? Mm. Modern public health infrastructure back then was still considered to be quite um, a new phenomenon. Mm. That the closest places you go to are probably your neighbourhood her um, herbal shops, quick yeah. remedies. So during the episode itself, there were reports that a common remedy was uh, potato, pumpkins and coriander leaves. And in fact, um, it was also so popular that the prices of potato actually was um, shot up from 35 cents per catty to actually $5. $5? Yes. Wow, so, um, that's quite an inflation. Yeah. So we're not sure whether it actually um, helped, Help. mm. but I think um, if people feel better than to wait for the vaccine, that perhaps might be uh, something that is psychologically helpful. So they prefer to feel like they're doing something yeah. to help themselves. Yeah. yeah. I've always heard of the Spanish flu as something that hit Europe. It was uh, interesting to hear of accounts of what happened then in Singapore, how people reacted. And Dr Liu shared a very interesting recipe of potato, coriander and pumpkin. Sounds like it's a great idea for dinner, but I'm not sure whether it is particularly useful for my research. I'm still interested to find out more natural remedies that the people were using in Singapore. So perhaps I need to dig much deeper into history and look more broadly into the kinds of medicines that were available in the past. So I found an old advertisement in the newspapers of February 1839, and it's for the sale of Morrison's Universal Vegetable Medicines, which it claims to be an invaluable cure and preventative of diseases. I'm really excited to have found this medicine because from the name, it sounds like it's plant-based, it's natural, and composition sounds like it could be just made of herbs. I'm really curious to find out what are the ingredients in this uh, medicine and if they are really as natural as it seems. Could this cure be exactly what I've been looking for? I'm a skincare entrepreneur and I specialize in natural, vegan products that heal the skin. I'm searching the past for natural ingredients to use in my formulations. And I've discovered a promising ad from 1839 for a cure called Morrison's Universal Vegetable Medicine. Could this medicine contain the very thing I've been looking for? So I ask the person who spent enough time with these old newspapers to know, curator Georgina Wong. I found this ad in the newspapers for Morrison's Universal Vegetable Medicine. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious about what was exactly inside and whether it was effective as uh, it claims to be. So the Morrison's Universal Vegetable Medicine, right? They claim to cure all kinds of diseases, mm -hmm. but what was really inside it was laxatives. Or laxatives. So plant-based um, medicines that were laxatives. Georgina tells me that Morrison's Universal Vegetable Medicine was a concoction of powerful laxatives such as gamboge, aloes and senna. And sold as convenient pills, the medicine claimed to treat all and every disease known to men simply by purifying patients of the badness inside them which could technically help, but the recommended dosage was so high that some patients just died. So people actually passed away from, yeah, from taking too many of these pills. Wow, yeah. that sounds really scary. Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty scary. So Morrison's Vegetable Cure was a really famous like, patent medication. So 
patent medications were something that came about in the early 1800s. It was the result of basically businessmen taking what were usually purported to be natural cures, natural ingredients, and turning them into medications that they would then copyright. And there was little to no regulation. You could put almost anything you wanted inside of them. And you know, you could claim anything you wanted as well. Everyone bought into it because it was so heavily advertised. It was a huge industry. Wow. Yeah. Okay, so I've actually brought with me a few of the ads for patent medications found in early newspapers published in Singapore. So for example, you've heard of Scott's emulsion, yeah. right? This ad says it was the standard remedy for lung troubles, chest diseases, digestive irregularities, and I love it, it says all children's ailments. So every <laughs> single children's ailment apparently could be cured by Scott's emulsion. Yeah. Georgina says that many of these medicines claim to be the very best curing everything from coughs and colds to eczema and hair loss, even all germ diseases and all diseases of the skin and blood. So there's a lot of exaggeration, a lot of hyperbole. And people wanted their medication to stand out amongst all the other advertising. Oh, it's incredible. Yeah, and none of these claims ever had to be substantiated. Although, just to be clear, they don't market like this anymore. It's only okay. back then in the 1800s they were doing this kind of advertising. So what were actually inside these medicines? Like, what were the ingredients that were used? So all of these were patented, copyrighted recipes and formulas. So what the companies will often do is they will keep them in secret. Mm. So it's hard for us to know exactly what was inside of them. Um, although generally, the, like, the general ingredients for these kinds of medications would be things like herbs or spices even, or even just minerals that could be ingested mostly, usually harmlessly. Mm. When Georgina told me about the Morrison's vegetable medicines, I was really disappointed to know that it was just laxatives and in fact, um, some people actually died from, from taking this medicine. I was really shocked to find out that a lot of these companies were just um, putting whatever claims that were out there and there was no regulation. Despite that, I'm still curious about what is actually inside these medicines, especially skin-related medicines. Like, the, there was one advertisement that says wild with eczema and, you know, it's, it's advertising a, a soap. And this would be really relevant to what I would like to find out. Luckily for me, the patents on these medicines have long expired. And much research has since been done to unmask the secret contents. Wow, these are really old medications yeah. that you have dug up. So I turned to Dr. Sue, a bona fide medical expert, to help me figure out if there is anything in these old cures that I can use, starting with the soaps. Dr. Sue, what are some of the ingredients in some of these products? Roland's Calidor doesn't have anything much that is of real medical benefits. Mm. It also has mercury. Mercury? Yes, okay. that's right. Yes, like the stuff in thermometers it is used as a skin whitener, but mercury is also toxic. Right. Even the one that claimed to cure eczema proved disappointing, as it contained paraffin, a mineral oil which I avoid, quite literally, like the plague. Maybe the other medicines might prove to be more promising? This is almost like a natural product. Oh, OK. This is uh, Sasa Parilla. It's sold as a universal panacea. Yeah. Is it effective, you think? The Sasa Parilla plant is used for many different things now, primarily it works as a kind of a laxative. No. No? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'm, I'm not really sure it does very much. I guess if you've got constipation, it will help, but that's probably about it. And it's pretty much downhill from there. Dr. Williams' pink pills, another so-called cure-all, contained mostly just iron and sugar, while Aya's cherry pectoral had... Heroin. Wow. So this product actually really? has heroin, yes. It has got no properties to treat influenza or any of the other conditions. So if you wanted a high, this is the one that you're going to get. <laughs> yes, doctor. So if these medicines were not so effective, why were these uh, medicines so popular? There were certainly a lot of infectious diseases at that time. They had smallpox, cholera, typhoid, in addition to other conditions that were caused by malnutrition, for example, mm. very, very. Okay. At the same time, there was certainly poorer understanding of diseases and what caused them compared to today. 
Dr. Su says that back then, many people believed that diseases were caused by bad air called miasma. Things that smelled bad led to sickness. And so did the air at night. And if it wasn't the bad air that killed you, then it was probably your own bad blood that did. They also felt that diseases are caused by toxins or poisons in their blood and systems. That's why a lot of these products mm -hmm. talk about purging poisons or stuff that will improve the blood. In fact, I learned that these ads could be so exploitative as to change their claims whenever major outbreaks occurred, like the Spanish flu. So you can see quite a number of these products claim to cure influenza. So there was a need and there was products that exploit that need mm. by making such false claims which thankfully have largely been stopped today. I was hoping to find some ingredients uh, that could be useful. However, it seems like from what Dr. Su has shared, um, this, there's really um, a lot of things that were questionable in these uh, um, medicines. All this is really making me think again, uh, perhaps I have to look further into, I don't know, maybe like local, uh, local ingredients, perhaps. So maybe it's time to stop looking into dodgy medicines and go straight to the source herself, Mother Nature. I run Oasis, a vegan skincare brand, and I am on a hunt for natural and healing ingredients to use in my products. My search into old medicines has only led me to dead ends and deadly ingredients. So I head to the Botanic Gardens to find out more about what I hope to be the real deal. Yeah, so this is the Ethno Botanic Garden. Traditional medicine, which Simin is an expert on. I'm looking for natural ingredients to be used in my products and I'm wondering about the plants that people in the past used to use. We've come to the right place. We have on display here over 300 native plants from this region, which the traditional communities used to use for a lot of remedies in the past. I see. From Indians, Malays, Chinese, and also some of our indigenous tribes. Everything they used to forage from the forest, including one of these things. Um, this is what we call the cat's whiskers. Simin says that medicinal plants like cat's whiskers and the infamous tonkat ali were consumed for their anti-inflammatory properties to treat ailments like fevers, while others like the andrographis paniculata and the senna elata were used to treat skin conditions like acne and fungal infections. We have one more plant here. This tree is called Phylanthus emblica or amla and it's known in a lot of Indian communities as something that they use for Ayurvedic medicine. Yeah. So these are the fruits of the amla tree. Oh, interesting. So can this be used for skincare? I'm sure you can because the fruit is very high in vitamin C, yeah. which is a very good antioxidant. Mm. So it will definitely help in skin healing, for example. And Simin shows me another plant that is good for the skin too. This plant is known as Centella asiatica, or the Indian pennywort. So this is a weed bud. It has a lot of medicinal properties. Oh, it's a very useful weed. Yes, it's supposed to have anti-inflammatory properties that helps in skin healing. The local communities will take the leaves and then they will pound it and work it into a paste. And then they will apply topically to your skin for diseases. Oh, wow, interesting. I should definitely look into this. So my meeting with Simin was really interesting because I got to know a lot more about like different plants that potentially can also be used in my production. I think it's really nice to know that just in our backyard and just in our environment, in our country, there's a lot of plants that we need to learn more about that we can possibly use in our daily lives and learn from the knowledge that people gathered over time. So after the meeting with Sumin, I decided to do a bit more research about the plants that she um, spoke about. And I think the one that, that appeals to me most would be the Centella Asiatica, 
as well as uh, the amla fruit because uh, these seem to have the most studies done uh, about their medicinal properties, specifically to a topical application, that means like for skincare. I'm exploring ideas of maybe making facial hair rinse, perhaps even a shampoo, or maybe even a, a, a bar of soap. I've managed to source powdered versions of the Amla and Indian Pennywort. So now it's time to make the final product. I've decided to make a solid shampoo using Amla and uh, the Indian Pennywort. Through my research, on, especially on uh, Amla, I found that it's actually an ingredient that was used in Ayurvedic medicine um, to treat a lot of scalp conditions. And Indian Pennywort as well is actually something that is very anti-inflammatory. So I, I figured that the most natural um, product to come out of using this ingredient would be making a shampoo. And for extra moisturising power, I'll be adding shea butter and some essential oils. I'm excited to get started. This journey has really been an interesting one. It made me think about the fact that there's actually so many um, plants that are valuable here that has uh, gotten lost of time. I mean, personally for me, I would love to be able to work with more local plants. It also reduces the carbon footprint. You know, you don't have to, you know, look at uh, like importing um, products from another side of the world when things can be right in our own backyard. This is what I really want to look into more so that eventually I can build a brand that can be proud to say that it's using local sources.